Welcome to Eagle Brook Church. We are so glad that you're here. We are continuing a series today called Ghost Stories. It's really a series about the supernatural. Now, whether you're highly familiar with and know your way around the Bible or you consider yourself perhaps a newbie to the scripture, I think there's quite a few stories in it that would make anyone say, did that really happen? I mean, especially the ones about spirits, angels, demons. I mean, there's just those stories that lean more on the stranger things side uh, of the Bible that may even seem a little unbelievable. And yet, they're true and tell us about a world beyond the one that well, we can see. I remember the first time I was exposed to a world beyond ours, and it was with the Goosebumps novel series in school. Okay, the first time I went through these, I said, man, what is going on in the world? Is this real? Now, obviously, I know it's not real, but it was, it was the first time I could even think of a world beyond the one that we can see. Then um, I remember seeing uh, The Sixth Sense, and it came, what we got out of, out of that movie was the phrase, I see dead people. And I remember being at lunch with, in middle school, and my friends are like, I see dead people. I'm like, I hope you don't, because that might make me one of them dead people, man. You might need to see a doctor, okay? And, and then uh, there was the classic uh, Angels in the Outfield. Now, if you have not seen this movie, that is the only thing I want you to take away from this message, okay? You need to go home and watch Angels in the outfield. Now, this is a movie that really shaped my sports theology, okay? This movie depicts this idea that angels help these baseball players become better than they really are. And I, ever since then, there are these moments when I'm playing basketball, and I've just thrown up some shots that are really just prayers, okay? And I, 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 I'm telling you what, I fully believe that angels have carried some of these basketballs into the hoop, okay? Now, there are times where my coach is like, Ryan, are you over there praying or shooting? I'm like, a little bit of both, but I got an angel with me right now, okay? Like, I would just, like, I, th that was just my, my, my exposure to the world outside of our reality. But the, the one that certainly impacts our lives here on earth is the one that's described in Scripture. I love what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians. It says, for... Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the unseen world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The scripture is showing us that there is the world that you and I can see, and then there is the world that you and I cannot see. Now, if it's your first time at Eagle Brook Church, and a friend invited you and told you, you should come to church. I promise you, it won't be weird, okay? Don't be nervous. Because here's what I know about every single person, Christian or not, church person or not, is this is what you need to know about the unseen world. Number one, there are supernatural forces that exist to completely destroy your life. That, that exists to completely destroy your life. This is how it says, it's how it says it in 1 Peter. It says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We have a very, very real enemy who wants to wreak havoc in your thought life who wants to wreak havoc in your love life, who wants to wreak havoc in your family life, and ultimately, that wants to wreak havoc on your faith. Now, here's the good news. Just like there are supernatural forces against you, guess what? There are supernatural forces for you that are godly, that exist to help you walk in God's will for your life. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 10. It says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. We have a very, very real Savior who went to great lengths to overcome evil. And he wants our lives and our relationships to be full of peace. Now, today, 
I want to look at a story in the Old Testament where we see a little bit of divine intervention. There is somewhat of a crossover between something that's happening in the heavens and something that is happening on the earth. Now, uh, the story takes place in 2 Kings. Just to give you some context for what we're looking at, we're going to be talking about uh, Elisha today. Now, you're going to hear me talk about Elisha today, and you might hear Elijah, and it can be very, very confusing when understanding the context of their stories. So let me just give you the gist of it. Elisha basically interned under Elijah, okay? They, they, Elijah was considered a biblical icon. He was what is considered a prophet whose primary job was to talk to God and help advise kings to follow the orders that God would give through a prophet. Of all the prophets, Elijah is probably the most notable one because Elijah is only one of two people in Scripture who never died. Okay, He just got swept up and taken up to heaven. So Elijah was a powerful prophet that Elisha interned under. Okay? Now, before Elijah was taken up to heaven, Eli he said to Elisha, tell me what I can do before you, before I'm taken up. And Elisha requested a double portion of Elijah's spirit. So Elisha is going, hey, Elijah, I want double of whatever you got. And in the scripture, there is seven notable miracles recorded for Elijah and 14 for Elisha. It's like Elisha is Elijah 2.0. So by the time we get to 2 Kings, we're at a point in Elisha's story where he has fully stepped into the shoes of Elijah, a prophet serving in advisory to the role of king of Israel. Okay? Now, for the rest of this message, no more Elijah. Okay? We're done with Elijah. We're only with Elisha. We good? Okay, now, 2 Kings 6, we learned that there was... Um, an evil king, the king of Aram, he was at war with Israel, and he looked for ways to set an ambush against the people of Israel. But what would happen is Elisha would hear from God about the king of Aram's plans and alert the king of Israel. He'd say, hey, here's the deal. Um, I've heard from God. You've got an enemy that's going to attack you at this place or that place, and he would alert the king of Israel. And so this would happen over and over again, and, he, and the king of Aram started getting frustrated, like, what is going on? And so the king of Aram gathers all of his people, and he's like, hey, hey, which one of you is a spy? How, how do they keep figuring out what our plans are? And one of them speaks up and says, hey, they got this prophet dude, and he know everything. Like, God keeps telling him your plans. He even knows what's going on in your bedroom, which the, the king's like, wait, what? Okay, listen. I want you to go find this guy. You tell me exactly where he is. And they, they did some scouting reports, and they found out, hey, he's in a city along with a servant of his own in a place called Dothan. And here's what the scripture says the king does next. It says, then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. So now we've got Elisha and his servant that are surrounded by this army. And this is where I imagine the leader of that army pulls out a megaphone and says, we've got the place surrounded. Come out with your hands up. And, 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 and the servant's like, what, 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 what are we going to do? And the scripture tells us this. It says, this is his response. It says, oh, no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asks, what shall we do? Have you ever had a what shall we do moment? When your kids aren't doing well in school, we kind of just go, what shall we do? When you're not getting playing time on your team, you go, what shall we do? When the Timberwolves make bad trades and bad picks, we're like, what <laughs> shall we do? I mean, you could just be watching the news on TV and just think about the state 
of our country and get to a place where we just think, what shall we do? When you and your spouse have an absurd amount of irreconcilable differences, but you stay together because of the kids, you pretend to love each other at family dinner, but deep down, you don't know if your marriage will ever thrive. You don't know if you'll ever be in love again. What shall we do? When your bills outweigh your income, what shall we do? When you lose a job altogether, what shall we do? When lab results from a medical facility have hijacked every ounce of hope in your soul, and you've lost track of how many doctors you've been to, what shall we do? Haven't we all had a moment in our life where it feels like someone just slammed on the emergency brake and left us looking at our situation, and we just thought, what shall we do? And Elisha's like, I got a response for you. I'm, what, what about this? Don't. Be afraid. Don't be afraid. You know a phrase you'll see a lot in Scripture? Fear not. Don't be afraid. Calm down. Now, here's the deal. One of the things that I've learned in, uh, as me and my wife are attempting to raise our children as best as we possibly can is um, they typically do the opposite of whatever you tell them to do. So if you say calm down, they hear let me turn up, okay? Let me lose my mind. Let me, let me raise my voice to a disrespectful level, okay? Like, even with adults, like the calm down monologue, how often does that successful for us? You know what I'm saying? Typically, when you tell somebody, calm down, that's usually a signal for them to ignite the fire a little bit. Like, it never really works. But in this instance for life, she's like, don't, don't be afraid that... This is, his, this is encouragement for his intern. He's going, I got an invitation for you. I, I want you not to be afraid, but I got a reason for you not to be afraid. And, and he says, um, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. He's going, hey, intern, I can see something that you cannot see. And 2 Kings 6 tells us this, it says, and Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Open his eyes, Lord. The irony in this statement is so interesting. The request to open his eyes was not a physical request. In fact, his eyes were just fine. He had just had LASIK. He, he, the intern's got 20-20 vision. That's why he's scared in the first place, because of what he can clearly see. But what's remarkable about, about this story is that when Elisha prayed for his eyes to be open. Help didn't come. Help was just revealed. Help was already there. The hills were already full of horses and chairs. Like, we good. You know what didn't happen when Elisha prayed? God didn't wipe out the army. Instead, what he did was in the middle of that crisis, he simply revealed his presence, his power, and all the help he had made available in the spiritual realm. He opened his eyes to see something in the unseen world, which is why I love what the Apostle Paul says. He says, for we live by faith, not by sight. We are not moved by what we can see in the natural in light of the help that we have in the super natural. Faith is a filter we look through to see that God has been there all 
along. You know what I love about this story? Is that for Elisha and his intern, their situation didn't change. Their perspective did. Their perspective changed. And I think this weekend we need ours to change too. I mean, let me ask you this question this weekend. How much of what you conclude about your life is based off of what you can see. What you can just see with your two eyes. How much of the conclusions that you've come to are based off of that? I believe our prayer this weekend should be, Lord, open our eyes. Lord, open our eyes. I think there's two main takeaways that I think we can get from this ghost story. And the first one is this. I think we need God's perspective on every crisis. I think we need God's perspective on every crisis, on every physical health crisis, on every mental health crisis, on every family crisis, on every career crisis, on every financial crisis. I I think we desperately need his perspective. And I have to wonder what would happen in my life and your life if God opened our eyes just a little bit more. I have to wonder if when God opened our eyes, if what we see as a crisis isn't a crisis really at all. I, I have to wonder. Does God even know what a crisis is? He's God. And in all of his existence, he has never had one moment where he freaked out on his throne and went, what are we going to do? God has never had a what shall we do moment. We do. And so I just have to wonder what would happen if we just took on his perspective on our life? Would we not experience an insane amount of peace? You want to know who never freaked out in this story? Elisha. Elisha is chilling. Note in the text, the intern went outside for the morning walk. Not Elisha. Elisha was inside sipping on a cup of joe and reading the morning newspaper. He's chilling. Elisha's looking at this intern going... <laughs> Internal medicine, just gotta, gotta teach you a few things, man. Here's the deal. Let me give you a little lesson on how this works. Not exactly sure the number of men and chariots they have us surrounded with, but one thing I am sure, however many they got, we got more. And we're gonna be all right. Elisha slept through the night confident. Elisha is unbothered. Elisha has peace. What shall we do, the intern asked, looking for natural marching orders. Isn't that what we all do? Don't we all want a practical step-by-step -step instructions on how to parent and how to deal with our families and our health and our finances? Elijah's reply is, Hey, in light of what I already know that has now been illuminated to you, my young intern, what shall we do? Nothing. What shall we do? Nothing. This time, we do the best we can in the natural, and we allow God to fight for us in the supernatural. What does that look like? That means sometimes... You go to a natural doctor while you pray to a supernatural God to heal you at the same time. I do my best in the natural, and I trust God for the supernatural. I love this verse in Isaiah that has been a core verse in my life as of late. It says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is is stayed on you because he trusts in you. What is your mind stayed on? Because it can be easy for our minds to remain on our crisis. But we've got options, ladies and gentlemen. 
our mind can stay on our crisis or our mind can stay on God and allow him to give us his perspective on every crisis we have. Um, when I had COVID-19, um, I quarantined uh, at a hotel to do my best to, to protect my family. I found out on like a Saturday night and I instantly bolted to, to a, a hotel. And um, you know, it's, it's interesting. A friend told me who had contracted COVID-19, he said, Ryan, the mental battle is almost as challenging as the physical battle. And when you contract COVID, you instantly think of every article you've read over the last year and so many different opinions. And when it's your body and your life, a lot of things go out the window and you just have to start making some decisions about how you're going to recover. And I got to tell you, I sat in a hotel room by myself. And it was incredibly difficult to keep my peace. You're just flooded. But there's just, there's just, there's just thoughts. You're, just, you're, just, you're thinking of so many things. And especially when I've got someone close in my life who passed away from COVID-19, it's real. And so day two of the quarantine, I'm in this hotel. And I, I, I said, I, I, can't, I cannot live like this. So I, I turned on some YouTube worship, OK? And I just said, we're just going to let it play all day. And it's amazing. I wasn't any less quarantined, but I had so much more peace because I had something playing that was inviting God's presence to fill my hotel room. And then I started praying for my family. And then I started praying for you. Then I started praying for this very message. And before I knew it, I started getting my peace back. It's amazing what can happen to our souls when our minds are fixed on the things of God. My brother-in-law called me then, and, and, and he said, man, sorry to hear what you're going through, but I'm willing to bet that God's going to download some powerful messages to you during all of this. And you want to know what it was? It was simply a perspective on my situation that I could not see. And guess what? My situation didn't change. Same situation, new perspective. And I think for you and me, we need an Elisha in our lives every now and then to come alongside us and help us see our crisis from a God angle. And sometimes, we need to be an Elisha for someone else and help them see their crisis from a God angle. So this weekend, I want us all to pray the prayer. Lord, open my eyes. Help me see every crisis from your angle, my own crisis, and even the crisis others around me may be going through from every relationship crisis to every work crisis. Lord, help me not to come to conclusions about my own crisis based off of what only I can see. And when tempted to do so, Lord, help us pause and ask the question, Lord, what do you see? What do you see? I love how this ghost story continues. It's rather interesting um, as the enemy came down toward Elisha and his intern, Elisha prayed this prayer. He said, Lord, strike them down with blindness. Boom, lights go out. They can't see nothing. And so Elijah begins to guide this entire army. He goes, hey, the man you're looking for, he ain't here. Follow me. And they blindly followed Elisha into Samaria. And then uh, the, the scripture tells us this. It says, after they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Interesting, he opened the spiritual eyes of an intern and the physical eyes of their enemy. It says, then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elijah, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill those you have captured with your own sword or bow? 
set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. Is there anybody else that's confused at this point in the story? What, what, unless I'm misreading the text, how is it that the army that was sent to take out Elisha and company is now sharing a great feast with them? Great feast. What kind of great feast have you ever had that didn't have dessert? Just think Thanksgiving spread, buffet laid out for their enemies, for their rivals. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen the, the, the second thing that I think we could take from this ghost story is I, I think we also need God's perspective on every rival. I want you to think about the person you view as a villain in your life. I want you to think about the group of people you may view as your enemy. I want you to think about the colleague you consider an adversary. I want you to think about the teammate or classmate that you might see as a, as a nemesis. I want you to think about the friend who you think is further ahead of you in life for your career that you'd rather cut down than celebrate. I want you to think about your ex. Every single one of those people is someone we need God's perspective on. Based on the text, you would think that for Elisha, who appears to have an angel army at his disposal, you would think that under his command, he would use those powers to wipe out his enemy. And the king said, what? Shall I kill them? Elisha's going to kill them. King, if God or I wanted them dead, we wouldn't be having this conversation. I've got a better idea. Why don't we show them who our God is and how his people treat rival enemies? Just imagine for a minute, you're the enemy and you've got your target surrounded. Your target, it's only two people, okay? There's two of them. The text tells us a strong force of chariots and horses were sent. Doesn't give us an exact number, but we know it's strong, okay? So you and your strong forces versus two dudes. One is a pastor prophet and the other is in Bible school, okay? You definitely like your chances. And all of a sudden, you're zeroing in on your target and boom, the lights go out. Hey, can you, can you see? Hey, can you see? Hey, what, who is that? What? He ain't here. Okay. And you follow him. The next thing you know, the people you were sent to kill now have you surrounded. And now you're thinking, well, that plan didn't work. Fellas, it's been fun. It's over. They, they got us. What are we going to do? And all of a sudden, you overhear the king and Elisha talking. Shall, I, shall, shall, shall we kill him? No, don't kill him. Make a great feast for them. Great feast. Did you hear that? Great feast. Did you hear a great feast? And the next thing you know, they roll out the red carpet for you and say, hey, let's, let's eat together. What? If you were a part of that rival army, you'd think the food was poisoned. You'd go, what's in this? Nothing. Just the only thing they experienced after eating it wasn't death. It was freedom to go home. Can you imagine? You know, on your way home, you're like, what just happened? What would you, what, like, can you just, can you believe what just happened? Imagine you, you walk through the door, wife ain't seen you in a couple days. Honey, I'm home. Oh, sweetie, you must be starving, actually. <laughs> I ate pretty good. You ate pretty, where'd you eat? Let me tell you something. Israel was Listen, they feast got it going on, okay? You, you, we should visit sometime when they're not all right, but it's good. It, what? God has a rather uncanny way of seeing our enemies. Sometimes he has a rather unusual way of dealing with rivals. Radical love. Elisha wanted his intern to see God's help in the middle of their crisis. Elisha wanted his king to see God's love for people while facing 
an enemy? Is there any person in your life that you could use God's perspective on? Perhaps someone through life circumstances has become a rival. Is there anybody that perhaps you've canceled out of your life in the last year that God may want you to forgive? You may not cook a meal for them, but maybe you could forgive them from a distance. The two questions I want you to think about this weekend is what does God want you to see from his perspective? And who does God want you to see from his perspective? You might find yourself in a place in life where you just feel like the enemy has you surrounded. It's one thing after another, and you just feel like you just can't get a leg up. You might be here today. You might be watching or listening today going, where in the world is God? Because I just, I just can't see him. My hope and prayer for you is that you would invite the presence of God to be in your life and that you would go to God and say, Lord, open my eyes and would you illuminate what it is that you're doing through this situation? I wish I could tell you that your circumstance is going to change. It might not. But that doesn't mean that God is any less with you. So don't look at your circumstance and make a conclusion about what God is or isn't doing. Ask God to give you his perspective on every crisis and when needed on every rival. God, I thank you so much for Eagle Brook Church. God, I pray for every single person watching or listening to this message that may find themselves in a situation, in a crisis that they cannot understand. God, I pray that this week you would open their eyes. Open their eyes. Help us to see every crisis and every person through your perspective. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Join us next weekend as we continue the series on ghost stories. Have a great weekend.